We're on. Okay, we're good. Okay, so as Joe mentioned, my name is Gary Keibel, and I'm an attorney with the law firm of Davis and Gilbert. Um, I actually practice in sort of three different areas, uh, advertising and marketing, technology, and privacy. And privacy is becoming a bigger part of everything, and you know, as Joe mentioned, it cuts across every industry. It used to be only discrete industries that would focus on privacy, and now as I speak to people, I say, it doesn't matter whether you are you know, a financial institution, an interactive advertising company, or a shoe store. You get data on consumers, and you need to keep that data secure. Um, prior to becoming an attorney, I was actually in IT. Uh, I worked uh, at Merrill Lynch, an investment banking division, doing information technology work. Got very tired of staring at the blue screen of death, and decided I couldn't take it anymore, so I went to law school. Um, and trying to put this together, you know, I was focusing on cloud computing, but you know, as the people in this room know, the topic of you know, security and privacy is just a massive, massive topic. Um, I don't know if some of you are involved. I go to a conference called the International Association of Privacy Professionals, IAPP. I'm very involved in that organization. They have, it's a great organization if you're focusing on privacy. They have a three-day conference uh, twice a year, which has about five concurrent sessions on all different privacy topics because there are so many topics, it's just impossible to cover all of them in a short amount of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a few issues that sort of lead into cloud computing. Um, as an attorney, I negotiate a lot of deals for cloud computing services, and uh, there are certain concerns that as a lawyer I have and that my clients have, and so I'm going to kind of give you sort of the history of, of how we get to those concerns, not just to jump right into cloud computing, but you know, what, what's the history, what's happened over the past couple of years to make us, from a legal point of view and from a business point of view, be concerned about some of these issues. And I would certainly encourage you, if you have a question, raise your hand right away. It's no problem to interrupt me. As I said, the topic is so broad that chances are I may not have covered the issue you, you want to ask about. So these are some of the topics I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about sort of the basic privacy framework, the existing federal and state security requirements, and what, what a company would do internally deal with security breach notification laws, because as a lawyer, that's the big thing always on my mind. And then deal specifically with cloud computing services and the contracts. And then I can't talk about privacy anywhere without talking about social media. It is the cause of you know, every problem that clients seem to have these days. All right, so general privacy principles. If you can't read the cartoon at the bottom, it says, what's to prevent some total stranger anywhere in the world from paying my bills? Um, this, I like, is a good example of how unrealistic consumers are about privacy and how your users sometimes are unrealistic about privacy. But the point is, they are your customers and they are your users. And if you don't address those concerns, they may not be your customers anymore. So in the United States, and things could change if you've read the, read the papers lately, we don't have one overarching law in the United States that governs privacy. It is that case in Europe. In the United States, we don't. The closest thing we have to one overarching law is what under the FTC has their fair information and privacy principles. Now, the fair information practice principles are not a law. It's principles that the Federal Trade Commission has put out to guide us. Because in my area, dealing with marketing folks and whatnot, the FTC is our main regulatory body. And they have really one key law. Their law is to regulate unfair or deceptive acts in or affecting commerce. Now you might think, what on earth does that mean? It sounds like lawyer weasel words. Well, that's kind of what it is. You know, what's unfair or deceptive? They decide. And so the FTC gives us a lot of guidelines to help us understand what's unfair or deceptive. And they have taken in the privacy and security issue under unfair and deceptive acts and practices. So they believe that it's fair information practice to give consumers these five items whenever dealing with information. Notice, always put consumers on notice about the type of information you collect. Choice, give consumers choice about whether or not to give you their information. Access, consumers should have a way to reach you and correct their information, delete their information. Security, which is now probably the biggest prong out of the five, but when this was first drafted, it was almost thrown in there, that you should keep the information secure. And enforcement, say what you do and do what you say. Don't put out a privacy promise and a security promise to the public and not follow it. Uh, you know, I like to make examples of companies when they screw up. You know, you think Google, really, you know, a high-tech company on top of everything. There had actually been a law in the state of California since 2004 that said you had to have 
a link to your privacy policy on your home page with the word privacy in it. Google did not put that link there until 2008. Now, as you've read the news lately, Google had a settlement with the FTC, so you know, they're actually getting egg on their face a lot. Um, maybe it's because this is their attitude. A quote from Eric Schmidt, former CEO. He said, there's what I call the creepy line. The Google policy on a lot of things is to get right up to the creepy line and not cross it. Um, perhaps this quote has a little bit to do why he's now the former CEO of Google, but he actually said this in a public conference. I was comparing versus EU, and it's important because you engage in a lot of international business, and I'm sure a lot of your business companies engage in international business. It's a very, very different framework. As I said, in, in the United States, we do not have one overarching law. It's piecemeal. We have uh, HIPAA for health information, GLB for financial information, COPPA for children's information. In Europe, they have EU, EU directives, the Data Privacy Directive, which governs all issues related to privacy, and the member states have to implement that directive. Um, there's a very different view of privacy at its core in the United States versus Europe. Uh, historically, the United States has been viewed as a, as a contract. Information is you know, property, and you contract for that information. In the EU, it's really viewed as a human rights issue coming out of World War II where data and information on who people were and where they were located was you know, used for, you know, to kill them. They really view data as belonging to the individual. Your identity, your personal information belongs to that individual and cannot be taken without permission. So in the United States, regulation is all over the place. We have various government agencies. We have federal level, we have state level, and all different standards. As you're going to see when we talk about security breach notification laws, it's really all over the place. There's not one standard. As I said, in the EU, you had the, the, the countries all have data protection authorities. That is a, a sort of a governmental office that deals just with data, privacy, and security. We don't have that in the United States. As I said, the FTC will handle some issues. Uh, Department of Commerce will handle some issues. Uh, Health and Human Services will hand, handle some issues. Uh, SEC, but it, it's all over the place, and they have other tasks. In Europe, you have these DPAs, which this is their sole task. And the way they handle data subjects is very different in both the EU and the US. The biggest thing when you're dealing, it's probably going to fall from the small font there, but uh, when, the biggest thing in dealing with the EU is cross-border data transfers. And this is the big thing that will come up in cloud computing. Again, I'm setting the table for the cloud computing concerns. In the United States, we don't really care where you send your data. You can collect your data, and there's no law saying that you can't shoot it to any country you want to shoot it to. <coughs> as long as you've made the proper disclosures to consumers about the data you collect and how you use it, you can send it wherever you want. That's totally fine. The EU, that doesn't work, because under the Data Privacy Directive in the EU, you cannot transmit personally identifiable information from EU residents out of the EU to a country that is deemed to have inadequate security protections. Guess what? The United States is deemed to have inadequate security protections. We're not good enough for that. So, obviously we could not live with this scenario when this was first put into place because of the amount of business we do. So we said, uh, EU, you've got to come up with something here to make this work, otherwise you're going to shut down global business. So they came up with, there's four key ways, there's actually a fifth way, but four key ways that data can be transferred from the EU to the US. Again, this is one way. Nobody cares if you take the information from a guy in New York and shoot it to London. But if you take information from someone in London and shoot it to the US, you've got to have one of these ways. Number one, the first way, have consent. That's very simple. If the end user, the consumer said, yes, you can transfer my information, done. Who's going to trump individual consent? That's perfect. The second thing is it's called the EU model contract. The EU put out a proposed contract. And they said if the company in the EU and the company in the United States sign this contract, which governs how the information will be protected and kept secure, then you can transfer the data. So you can actually sign this contract and be done in five minutes. The scary part is this contract has some very scary terms, uh, not one of which is that every single individual data subject then has a right of action against the US company back in their home jurisdiction, which can be a little scary. Binding corporate rules. This is a new one uh, where a large organization that has internal practices and procedures can go around to all the member states and show the DPAs their rules and say, look, we do such a great job with security, you should certify us. And the DPAs will say, yes, you're certified and you're now an authorized company to receive data from the EU. Uh, that can be time consuming, 
the EU countries are now getting together, so you don't have to go to 20 some odd states individually, but it's still a time consuming, expensive process. So the most common thing is a program through the Department of Commerce called the US EU Safe Harbor Program. And what this is is sort of a self certified program. If you're a US company, you would go through this process with the Department of Commerce to provide them certain information and self certify your information practices and make some disclosures about your security practices. We would also designate a party in the U.S. to hear complaints if consumers in the EU had a complaint about how you handle their information. That's fantastic because now you can deal with the complaints in the U.S. You don't have to deal with it in the EU. You also don't have to sign a zillion individual model contracts. Once you're on the safe harbor list, you're done. You are now deemed adequate to receive information. Now, this list has been around for oh, over a decade. Department of Commerce and the FTC had not brought a single enforcement action against anyone for being on this list or doing anything wrong until about a year and a half ago. And we were all sitting around waiting, like, my God, when are they going to do something? Because you could literally go on the website and certify in 10 minutes just by lying. And they were never checking up on this. So they brought the first action against one company, actually for the reverse. They were saying they were Safe Harbor certified, but they had not registered. But you can expect to see more enforcement actions in this area. Question yeah. about the, uh, the Data Protection Authority. Sure. Uh, Sweden was one of the earliest ones, if I remember right. Are they still uh, like a model, or well, what's a good model in that area of the DPA? Whenever you're looking at security issues and privacy issues, um, I think of it more from the privacy aspect than the security aspect of who's the most restrictive when it comes to privacy. I always look at Germany and Spain. Those, you, you, you never want to say, you know, if I satisfy one, I satisfy all. But if you're able to satisfy the regulators in Germany and Spain, you're probably in good shape. Spain's actually trying now to ease up a little bit because they've been scaring people. And with their economy crumbling, you don't want to scare people away. Uh, Germany, the reverse, is actually stepping it up. They were the ones who busted Google for Street View. Um, yeah. With the binding corporate rules, um, do you have to periodically reprove or recertify? No, they, the, the uh, individual countries have the right to audit and check up on you. But uh, it, it's sort of news. I don't know if any of them have been doing that. Um, but I mean, the last I checked, the number of companies who had gone through binding corporate rules was very small. I mean, really large companies, you're talking about, you know, like a, like a GE or something like that. I mean, for other companies, it's really going with the Safe Harbor program. What yeah. stands out in Spain and Germany that would make you select them as, as two sort of model countries? Just, I mean, at the level they look at the protection of their consumers for privacy. I mean, Google, uh, Germany has now gotten to the point, they said, that the use of Google Analytics on a website is, is unfair without a proper you know, consent from the consumer. Just con collecting basic analytics. Uh, they've been looking very closely at social networking, very disturbed about how the information is collected. Um, I mean, we're looking at it from our view, but from their view, they look at it that they are protecting their consumers from these services that don't handle information the way that they would like it to be handled. Um, and with Google Street View, the Federal Trade Commission in the United States said they didn't do anything wrong. And in Google, I mean, in Germany and in other countries, they are you know, facing some serious liability. Just, yeah. Just a, a comment about the cross-border data transfer. That that also includes even within your own corporation. Yes. Yes. If you have uh, you know a facility in the EU and you have a facility in the US, that's a cross-border data transfer. It's not about the company, because again, going back to why the EU puts these rules in place, it's about that individual. It's for, for their point of view, it's about protecting that individual person located in the EU from having their data shipped out of the EU. So it doesn't matter if it's company to company, company to third party, anyone, it still applies. What I'm thinking about is if you have a, a corporation, multinational, and you have a, uh, a risk policy for recovery of uh, lost data and stuff like that, how does that cover the fact that you have the databases in many different places? So this, this gets a little hairy with how to set up that, that insurance that we had covered got two months ago. Oh yeah, I mean, and this is why this is this, this is why this is table setting for cloud computing right. because you've asked the question, where's the data located? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the whole point. If I don't know where the data is located, how do I know that I'm com complying with this? If I sign up for a service and I just you know sign a contract and suddenly great, you know everything's virtual, you know my data's flying all over the place. How do I know that it's not in Europe and I'm collecting EU information and bringing it here? When I've had clients deal with situations and they have a database of EU consumers. The first thing we say is, where is it going to be located? Because yeah. that becomes a big issue. Do we have to have a history of, uh, of data of where it's located? Do we have to have like a log? 
Well, on and a piece by piece basis, or what? in order to have good internal controls and comply, you're going to need to know that question where your data is located. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you know, a, a situation arises, a regulator comes knocking at the door to ask questions. <coughs> and you never want to tell a regulator, "I don't know." Right. Yeah, that, that's what, would, would they be entitled? Would Germany investigator be entitled to say, "Look, here's Mr. Smith's records. What computer has it been in?" They, yeah, they, they, could they ask that? They could ask that. It's always a question about whether or not they have jurisdiction over you. Yeah. You know, Google, large multinational corporation, they have jurisdiction over them because they have offices all over. Um, but they're certainly going to ask that question. You know, if you're a small company located in New York with no offices anywhere else, chances are they're not going to have jurisdiction over you. And uh, I'm assuming, Gary, that yeah. that would be part of, if, if you were being sued, that would be part of the discovery process from, from a law firm. You know, they would be digging into that saying, well, hey, look, if I got here, you should have been able to get here to mm -hmm. determine that your information actually was in three or four different countries and you didn't even know it. Yeah, I mean, you cannot hide where the data was. You get a good forensics company, they will follow the you know, electronic breadcrumbs and they will find where the data was located. So you want to know those questions, you know, in advance. Right, right. You know, it's kind of like they, you know, teach lawyers in law school who are going to become litigators. Never ask a question of a witness if right, you don't know what the answer is going to be. <laughs> so you got to know yourself. So security obligations. You know, I said that I used to be an IT guy. You know, back in the '90s, and you know, back then, if we ever had a security breach or incident, the number one thing we would do is all get together in a room, try to figure it out and solve it, and then whoever was in charge would look around the room and say, "All right." Now, nobody tell anybody what happened. <laughs> that would be rule number one. Everything got turned on its head. You know, very, very different. Um, it started in 2003 with the state of California coming up with the first security breach notification law. And I think I was one of the, you know, early people to kind of see what a, what a really, you know, change this was, a sea change in the way we conduct business, having been a former tech guy. When I read this law, I'm like, wow, you actually have to tell people that you screwed up. It's not bad enough you screwed up. You got to tell people about it. I mean, really a big sea change. California has been a source for a lot of laws on privacy, and that affects the whole country. Um, one big thing which came in in 2005, and again, no one paid much attention to it, was a law that said a business that owns or licenses personal information about a California resident shall implement and maintain reasonable security procedures and practices. All right, sounds harmful enough, but up until this point, there had never been a law that told you you must implement good security practices. It was a good idea. You know, it was a good business practice. If you look back at the FTC Fair Information Practice Principles, it would seem to fall within there. But there was no law that said you must implement reasonable security practices. This law kind of sat there for a couple of years, nothing happening. It had an extra interesting part, which I thought was fascinating. It said a business that discloses the personal information pursuant to a contract with a non-affiliated third party shall require by contract that the third party implement reasonable security procedures. Now, having been a lawyer for a long time, for, you know, for 10 years or more, reading old contracts, they would say, when they host your data, we don't guarantee any security. And here was a law that said, complete reverse. Third party gets your data, they must, or actually it's really the, the, own, the owner of the data, you must require in the contract that they implement reasonable security. Again, 2005, this sat around nothing. 2006, I'm sure people were getting hosting contracts, and they said, we don't guarantee any security. And I actually had an argument with a company located in California once. I'm like, don't you guys read the newspaper? Yeah. What did that do to IMM, the archives at IMM? They have to give you some reasonable security practices. They're going back. What about the old stuff? The old, the old, the old retroactive. No, and I'll give you an interesting thing. It's like you're, you're, you got a very good point there because there was one company, state that looked at it a little bit retroactively. Um, there are lots of examples. I'm just flying through a few. Nevada has a very interesting one that applies to businesses in Nevada about encrypting data. The most interesting thing about the Nevada law is they say they've actually implemented PCI DSS. For those of you familiar with the credit card industry standards, it was very interesting for a state law to incorporate a private standard. I've really never seen that before. Usually, you know, a, a law, a state law or federal law, they have their standards, it's the law. But it's very interesting for a state law to refer to a private standard and say it's a violation of law if you don't comply with that private standard. Now, the big one, Massachusetts, if I put it big letters, <laughs> hopefully I spelled it correctly. Uh, Massachusetts came out with a law which they delayed, 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 
but finally became implemented in March of 2010, and this really got the ball rolling on what California tried to do in 2005. What Massachusetts said to us is, in implementing regulations is they said, every person that owns or licenses personal information about a resident of the Commonwealth shall develop, implement, and maintain a comprehensive information security program that is written. All right, a little similar to the California thing, but Massachusetts said, we're going to go and enforce this thing. We're very serious about this. A couple of interesting things. It says, not Massachusetts companies, but every person that owns or licenses data. They intended this to apply to everybody. If you're a company located in Iowa, and you have information on a Massachusetts consumer, they expect this to apply to you. They also said the information security program must be written, meaning there must be a document that if the regulators come knocking on your door, you could present. They had delayed this many times, but again, it became effective in March 2010. It has three main problems. Number one, you must have a written information security program. There must be a document governing how you protect information. Number two, kind of like California, contracts with third-party service providers. You need to get those third parties to keep the information secure and have them bound by contract. And number three, they actually implemented some encryption requirements. Let me give you a quick example of some of these things. Um, I had told Joe, I, I, I'm not going to leave slides here, but if anybody wants a copy of the slides, I can give you a redacted version. Just give me your talk card at the end, because there are some things I'll slip through. I'll, I'll, I'll flip through here. The, they gave you actually very nice 12 bullet points about what should be in an information security program. I won't go through all of them, but if you were ever trying to put a program together, it's a nice little guidance. Here's the regulators who told you what should be in, the, in your program. For encryption, they required encryption for data, PII traveling across public networks or wirelessly, or stored on laptops or other portable devices. Now, that's difficult, you know. Um, when I deal with, you know, non-IT folks, and I start explaining to them about encryption, and how if things are encrypted, you get, you know, a free pass from all of these laws, and, you know, you're not required to, you know, make notifications and whatnot, they always say, well, why don't we just encrypt every single thing we have? And I say, go back to your company and ask your CIO if they will encrypt every single thing they have, <laughs> and you'll see the expression on their face, you know. You're going to have to triple their budget, triple their staff, and then maybe you can get that done, and it'll be a challenge. Right, Lance? Right. <laughs> so, we're not tripling the budget just yet. <laughs> but, at least for Massachusetts, they said, look, obviously you don't have to encrypt anything behind your own firewalls in your own shop. But if it's flying around on laptops, we want it encrypted. And, you know, a lot of security breaches are because of the lost laptop. Um, in terms of service providers, and this gets to your point about that being retroactive. So, everyone's sort of freaking out saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've had contracts that have been around for 10 years. I've had contracts that I just auto-renew. What am I supposed to do? So, the big thing they said is that we're going to give you a grace period. We're going to give you two years. And if you can't read the bottom, it says grace period for pre-March 1, 2010 service provider contracts until March 2012. What they said is, if you've got a pre-March 2010 contract, you've got until March 2012 to amend it and bring it up to date. But any contract you signed after March 1, 2010 had to comply. So if you signed a contract with the hosting provider dealing with Massachusetts data on March 2nd, 2010, it had to have reasonable security requirements in that contract. So they thought about that in advance. Um, in terms of security laws, I mean, I can go on forever. 20 states that have, that have some sort of unique security law, all addressing different topics about disposal of information, about use of social security numbers, uh, about you know, extra disclosures to consumers. Um, and then on the federal level, we have lots of them. I mean, this is a real nightmare trying to comply with everything. Graham Leach Bliley uh, has the safeguard rules for financial institutions. Uh, FACTA, Fair Accurate and Credit Transactions Act, that's implemented by the FTC, they put in place their red flags rules that says that any creditor that has information has to have a written policy. HIPAA and high tech dealing with health information. If you're in the pharmaceutical industry, you know what a beast this is to deal with. Uh, so there's just a lot of things out there that are kicking around. It's interesting that New York's missing. Yes, we've got some stuff, but I, I kind of put the ones up there that we have the real ones that go to the heart of data security. We have security breach, which I'll get into in a minute, but in terms of something dealing uniquely with a security requirement, you know, some of these are you know, extra requirements for health data or extra requirements for financial data, and we don't have that yet in New York. I, I know there was some talk about the federal government aligning with the Massachusetts law. Mm -hmm. I don't know where, if that's gone anywhere. Talk about the carry proposal? Yeah. It was just submitted yesterday. 
Yeah, so, you know, Senators Kerry and McCain submitted their, their bill today. Uh, everyone's been looking at Massachusetts. That's why I put it in really, really big font. Because everyone's been looking at Massachusetts since that came out and saying this is a good model. And it could be a good model for the whole country. So whenever bills are coming in Congress, everyone's thinking about Massachusetts. Does it work well with that one? Um, yes, Senator Kerry McCain came up with a privacy bill, uh, which is, I think, believe being submitted today. It's sort of a privacy bill of rights. Um, you know, on the one hand, it sounds like fluff, but, you know, there's something real here. It, it could be, again, the first broad national law that applies to privacy for everything. It's not just a particular type of data, like these laws. It's, it's not just online, it's offline, it's everything. So that really could be a change, you know, if that goes through, depending on how regulators have to implement those, that law. Well, the big thing, I mean, I was going through that and reviewing it for my company, and, um, you know, one of the big things I found, anyway, is that they redefine what PII means. So they break down PII and UII, which is, you know, so there's some redefinitions there that I, I wonder how they're going to, you know, uh, resolve against the other right. laws. And every industry has their own definition. Yes. Healthcare has a definition of PII yes. and financial has, so that's, that's going to be, you know. That was the big, to me, the big confusing part of it. Yeah, that's been a challenging thing in the U.S. You know, as I'm going to get into security breach notification laws, when I have a breach and deal with it with a client, and we analyze what data was exposed, I have to look at each individual state because the PII definition is different all over the place. Contrasting again to Europe, the, the, the uh, Data Privacy Directive defines PII unbelievably broadly. Really, anything that can identify an individual. And That's also, what... I'm sorry. It's yeah. also varies across each industry also how yes. PII is. Very different view in the U.S. In the EU, it's anything. And that's why they view an IP address as personal information, because they believe it can come back and identify the person. But in the U.S., I mean, all these laws, I mean, all 20 of those have their own definitions of PII. So it's very, very different. And, and Gary, on the red flag rules, because we covered that, I think, about a year ago, it, isn't the, the federal government still having a hard time implementing that? It's, it's not yeah. fully implemented yet, is it? Well, so what happened was... Uh, the Federal Trade Commission sat around and read FACTA and said, all right, we have to implement these red flags rules and who do they apply to? And they viewed the term creditor and interpreted it very broadly. They said anyone who extends credit, meaning you provide a service and you bill them 30 days later, hmm. you're now a creditor. And so a couple of industries freaked out. Most importantly, lawyers. <laughs> so we said, whoa, whoa, we shouldn't be subject to any new laws. So, yeah, that's not right. So uh, we didn't stop there. Uh, the American Bar Association sued the FTC. <laughs> um, and doctors did also. Doctors got in there to sue also. And so Congress amended the law and to clarify it. And now it's gone back to the FTC to fix it again. And the FTC is like, you still could be a creditor. <laughs> and the ABA is like, are you kidding me? You know, we got, you know, hundreds of thousands of lawyers around the country. We're not going to stop. Um, so it's still, you know, being worked on. I mean, you know, it, it applies to many industries, but whether or not it applies to every single one who, you know, bills on net 30 basis, that still, you know, probably does not apply to those companies. Um, internal policies. I was talking about the laws that require internal policies. There, there can be and there are endless internal policies. Uh, they oftentimes depend on the type of organization you are and the type of employees you have, the number of employees, where they're located. Common policies that I'll see from clients that I work with are, again, the information security policy, such as Massachusetts requires, an employee manual. An employee manual not only sets forth, you know, a vacation policy, anti-sexual harassment policy, it will have an email usage policy, an internet usage policy, other technology usage policies like that. I will see vendor policies. When a company hires a vendor to do work, we say, here's our vendor policy, which you must comply with about security. Security breach incident response plan. If you have very sensitive information and there might be a breach, you might want to have a written plan about what you do so everyone's not running around, you know, with like a chicken with their head cut off when something happens. Disaster recovery. Obviously a big plan if something goes down, how do you guys get up and running? And as a lawyer, I see in contracts when I represent a vendor providing services to somebody else, that my client's customer will say, I want to see your disaster recovery plan. I want to see your incident response plan. Because they want to know that you're prepared in case something happens. Because you may be providing a mission critical service. And they want to make sure you're not going to be down for three weeks if you know, your building catches fire. They want to know you have a plan. And training. Training is just 
I can't emphasize it enough. You know, everyone in the room here is very smart. And I don't want to put down the users out there, but I will put them down. They're very dumb. And they make lots of mistakes. And they need to be educated about how to properly handle security issues. Um, I have had, again, through that contractual requirement, I've had clients who are required to train their employees on privacy and data security measures. And they've had me come in and give training to the employees on privacy and data security. You've never seen a room of more bored employees on earth being forced to go to listen to a lawyer about privacy training. Uh, just a shameless plug, InfraGuard does offer information security awareness training for employees. Very good. Yes, we do. Yep. $25 a person for the basic course. It's not boring. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's great. I mean, you should get out there because it's super important. And it's the best way to avoid problems. Every war story you know, happens because you know, some you know, employee didn't know what they were doing. He's Columbo, Mr. Rogers, like they had yesterday. <laughs> so, so talking about war stories, I'll give you a war story. So this is about, again, training, making sure you know your employees know what to do. This is Greer versus 1-800-Flowers.com. Mr. Greer decided to call up 1-800-Flowers and order some flowers for his girlfriend. Typical normal thing. So he picks up the phone, he calls, he says what flowers he wants, and he says to the customer service rep, or sales rep, he says, you know, I'm a little bit concerned about privacy, so what do you do with my information? And they said, don't worry, Mr. Greer, we have a privacy policy on our website. You can go read it. We keep all your information secure. So Mr. Greer said, great, I will buy the flowers for my girlfriend. Well, the one person he didn't clear it when buying the flowers was with Mrs. Greer, his wife. So. At the time, 1-800-Flowers had a policy of sending you a little thank you card when you order flowers. So where do you think they send the thank you card? They only have one address, the home billing address and the credit card. So they send it to the home billing address. And who gets the mail that day? Murphy's Law. Mrs. Greer gets the mail. So she opens the card and says, thank you for your order. And she's thinking, huh, we, we, we didn't order any flowers. So she's curious, and so she calls up 1-800-Flowers and gets a customer service rep. And the customer service rep proceeds to tell her everything tells her Mr. Greer ordered the flowers, who they were delivered to, even reads the contents of the little card that went inside the flowers to the girlfriend. Ouch. So, <laughs> the customer service rep did not know that there was a privacy policy that said, we don't disclose the personal identifiable information to other people without their consent. You know, there was a great privacy policy. The customer service rep was just trying to be helpful, but there was no connect. So when you put policies and procedures in place, it's a real combination of legal, IT, marketing, customer service, depending on what, what area you're dealing with. Everybody's got to be involved. You know, if you're dealing with employee data, HR people got to be involved. It's really got to be a collective effort because someone's going to make a mistake. And that's exactly what happened here. It's just someone who wasn't trained in how the policies work. You also have to consider, even when you expose CRM information to your own customers, mm -hmm. that that same circumstance can happen. That, you know, a, a wife coming in and seeing the purchases on her husband's credit card can see his girlfriend's jewelry that just got bought. Yep. And we're wrestling with that now in terms of allowing our customers to uh, uh, take a look at their own information. Yep. It's, it, you always got to think, you know, I mean, data is, you know, it's like water. I was like following where it goes and what's going to happen. I mean, when I got your email, Joe, last night, I was in the middle of typing an email to a client about data who wanted me to analyze the contract if they were allowed to take certain data and give it to their customer because they were worried it was a little bit sensitive. And I analyzed the contract and said, yes, you are allowed to give the data to this customer, but you don't know what that customer is going to do with the data. And so we need to lock up that customer and make sure that they're not going to use the data for any particular purpose. You can't just trust them because your, they're your friends. So I mean, it's like water. You've got to follow where this stuff goes because it will end up somewhere you don't want it to be. Uh, yeah. Uh, banks a long time ago made the uh, the, the joint account uh, rules. Uh, have credit cards uh, kept track with that that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I believe that you know, for all all financial accounts, you, know, you can authorize you know others you know to be on the account. You know, the big issue is whether or not someone's authorized. Um, you know, today's my anniversary, and didn't quite get the exact anniversary gift I was planning because I was going to get my wife the iPhone four. And so I went to the AT&T store, I said, yeah, I want to get the iPhone 4 for her account. And they clicked away, click, click, clack, and they go, yeah, you're not authorizing her account. I'm like, well, can I just buy it and I'll return it? They go, nah, you're not authorizing the account. So I had to take the flyer. <laughs> I'll see how that works out tonight. <laughs> Actually, the phone company in your bill has six extra digits, and that's specifically done in the 70s for divorce. So yeah. if couples got divorced, you would, the person who left the household 
wouldn't have a copy of the bill and wouldn't have those extra six digits to verify. Yeah, they, they were tough. I could have bought it at the Apple store because they don't sell you a data plan. But AT&T would not sell it to me unless I was either authorizing that account or like bought a new data plan, which of course I wasn't going to do. So I'm taking it to a nice dinner, though. Don't worry, I'll make up for it. Um, the FTC, again, gives us more principles and guidelines. What do you do with data? You know, these are very nice principles to guide it. Take stock, you know, to your question before. You gotta know what you have. How do you, how do you deal with policies you don't know what you have? Scale it down. Don't keep everything forever. You know, that's, that's a challenge. And don't look at me, Lance. I like keeping my emails, you know? I need them. Um, but you really should only save data if you know, you've got a legal requirement to keep it, you've got a contractual requirement to keep it, or there is a legitimate business need. You know, and as lawyers, it's something we talk about. That you know, you know, if the client calls you ten years later, you know, do you have the whatever? They may not like the answer that we don't have it anymore. So uh, you know, but sometimes that has to be the answer. We don't keep it forever. Um, lock it again. Security, 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 nonstop. Pitch it. Dispose it properly. Do not just take the records with PII and put it in the dumpster, because then you can end up in an enforcement action like CVS or Rite Aid when people went dumpster diving and found records, uh, prescription records on consumers. And plan ahead. Have, have written plans and contingency plans. Um, how much time do I have so I don't go super uh, far? We're about 10.15, uh, so let's see here. Yeah. That's okay. We're close. It's a lunch. We're close. <laughs> we're close, yeah. Uh, I've okay. got another 10 minutes. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip through a couple things again. Like I said, Give me your card, I'll send you a redacted version of the slides. BJ's was the first big security breach that, uh, that a lot of folks started focusing on because the FTC started to look at it. And since then, the FTC has gotten into about 33 data security cases. Again, there is no specific law that they are enforcing about the requirement to keep data secure. They view it as an unfair practice to collect information from consumers and not keep it secure. If that information is revealed, that is unfair. It is also, in their view, deceptive to tell consumers, I'm going to keep your information secure and then not keep it secure. There have been many, many enforcement actions. And you can look those up on the FTC's question. website. Uh, CIO, data mining. You look for data mining of your, of your data that's going through your company to get deeds and stuff like that. Now, some of that stuff is, is uh, critical information for the consumer, uh, but you want to know it, where is your business heading? So you have a legitimate need to know it, but, but how, do you, how do you deal with that kind of stuff? Well, with, with any data you collected, if you collected it from consumers, right. there had to have been disclosure about how you're going to use the data. And then if you want to change the way you're going to use the data, you, know, you would need to tell the consumers again. Now, the use, if it's internal, I mean, the permitted use can be incredibly broad. The big thing that the FTC is concerned about is third-party sharing. Because if I give my, my data to company A, I expect company A is going to use it. I don't expect it to end up in the databases of Company B because I did not give them my data. And in the bill that's coming out from, from Senators Kerry and McCain, third-party data sharing is going to be one of the big issues. Yeah, I mean, just a simple thing. I go to the supermarket. If I buy some uh, yogurt, they're going to give me a coupon. But I'm not going to get the coupon if I don't buy the yogurt. And that's in my, in my, uh, in my uh, receipt box. And they have now a record of that. Oh, yeah. I, mean, they, I, I don't care about it, but... Yeah. But that's just like an example. One of the things that you know, the FTC always looks at is a consumer's expectation. And expectations offline are very different than online. Yeah. Offline, you kind of deal with someone, you, you know where it's happening. Online, you're not clear. And that's why they focus all these disclosures more in the online world, because they view that consumers just don't understand what's happening with data. They don't understand cookies. They don't understand you know, behavioral marketing and targeting. And so we need better explanation. Um, I got a lot of war stories, but I'll, sk I'll, I'll, I'll skip this war story. You buy me a beer once, and I'll tell you what uh, I have in common with Paris Hilton. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who is accountable in an organization? Chief Privacy Officer. Most organizations have someone. You've got to have someone that is responsible for these issues. You know, not that you want to have someone to blame, but you want to have someone who's a central repository for the information, for the policies, in case there's a breach. Someone who takes control. As I said, you got to get everybody involved, legal, IT, business. They have to all work together. We need to be on the same page. Security breach notification laws. This is a huge thing for me as an attorney. Um, California started it. There are now 46 states that have security breach notification laws, and they generally apply to unencrypted PII. If there's an unauthorized access to unencrypted PII, you must go tell the consumer. I'm sure many people have gotten those notices here. This is a very big issue, and the reason is because it's very time-consuming and expensive. 
Yes, New York, we do have a law. It applies to what we call private information in New York. Again, we all have our own definitions. Um, New York also requires that you notify the state attorney general's office. There are about seven or eight states that require that. That's never fun. It's never fun writing a letter to a regulator saying, I've done something really, really bad. You, know, you, you don't want to go out and tell them that, but you have to here. What do you do when a breach occurs? You know, you got to activate your team, assess the breach, close the hole, deal with the security breach notification laws. You've got to deal with PR, too. I mean, you talk about Epsilon. Epsilon was not a violation of security breach notification laws. It was just a PR nightmare. Yes. And they violated, I guarantee they violated contracts with their clients. But it was not, it did not implicate the security breach notification laws because it was email. And I believe there's only one state in the United States where email alone triggers security breach notification. But I think there's a way to get out of it based on risk of harm. Uh, hey, I'm finally gonna talk about cloud computing. Um, so a lot of this you know, sets the table when I look at cloud computing. So when I look at cloud computing, a couple of things. First question I ask is what are you buying? What is this? Is this software as a service? Is this an entire platform as a service? Is this infrastructure as a service? You know, I kind of want to know how mission critical this is to me. You know, if this is just you know, some software program for uh, you know, designing you know, graphics, I'm not going to care as much you know, if it goes down. And you're not going to have very sensitive information. But if this is my entire infrastructure in the cloud, it's going to be very critical. And you're going to have very sensitive information. Um, how will it be deployed? Is this going to be a private cloud operated by one organization or a community cloud? Is it open to the public? Is it a hybrid? They're all different models. Again, you'll want to know who's operating this, where it is. Um, getting a little techie here, you know, I mean, where is the data going to be? You know, is it this single tenant versus multi tenant structure? You know, is my data going to be on a single server that's dedicated to me? Is it going to, am I going to have other you know, parties that are on that server? Have you set up with logical servers so it's all over the place, which is the entire point of cloud computing? So you, you want to take a look and find out because it gets to that question, where is my data? And you know, the answer will usually be that well, we have a number of data centers, and our data centers are located in the following three locations. But you want to ask these questions. You know, I've dealt with cloud computing contracts, the big parties out there, Google and Microsoft, pushing very hard. And you, know, you ask the question, where are your data centers? And they will tell you. And you ask more pointed questions, and they will reveal information. Um, I like this quote from the CTO of Amazon about you know, what is cloud computing. He says, if you have to buy more hardware just to get started, it's not the cloud. Um, beware of the false cloud. You know, obviously, cloud computing is supposed to save you money. It's supposed to be easier to implement. Um, vendor selection, I went through, I, I can go through some of this, or I'll, basically the point is you want to ask a lot of questions of your vendors. Uh, and a lot of companies will send them questionnaires. I could spend an hour on this contract, on, on this slide, the, the contract terms. I mean, this is huge. This is what governs your rights. So, number one, talking about, you know, what is the service? I want to know what is, what is it you're providing me? Security obligation. There must be some obligation in your contract to maintain reasonable security. Some companies form contracts will still not say any. Then you push back and they will come back with some boilerplate language. Breach notification procedures. What are you going to do if there's a breach? Uh, I actually had one cloud computing provider that was fighting me over the amount of time that they would notify me when there was a breach. And their argument was that, well, we want to do our own internal forensics before we go out and tell customers. My argument was, I need to mitigate the harm you've caused me. The minute you know there's a breach, you've got to tell me. You can't wait. And they actually wouldn't bend on that. Um, audits. You know, usually in IT agreements, you want to be able to audit your provider. How do you audit a cloud pro provider? That can be very challenging. Uh, they may be willing to give you a SAS 70 report. They may be willing to allow you to engage a third party to come in and audit them. Uh, I was on a panel at salesforce.com and they had a whole process where they will give audit reports. So there are ways you can get information. The SLA, so this is a big thing. You know, I'm no longer in control. You know, that's what makes people nervous, you know, about going to the cloud. You know, at least if it's in my server room, if something goes wrong, I can point my finger at someone and blame them. Or I can go down there and kick the server. You know, but if I'm not in control, what's going to happen? So I want to know, what is your uptime commitment? And I play lots of games with the five nines because you see a lot of games that people try to play with carving out. You know, we'll be up 99.999% of the time, except when we're down for scheduled maintenance or emergency maintenance. And I'm like, you never have to be up. Because whenever you're down, you go, oh yeah, well that's emergency maintenance. So we play games with this a lot. Um, support services. Uh, if you're working a cloud service, I want to know that I can reach somebody. 
And depending on the importance of this system to my organization, I may need to reach someone 24-7. Response time. You generally don't get resolution time, but you want a response. You know, that you'll respond to my, you know, a severity one issue within 30 minutes and give me a proposed resolution in two hours or something like that. And there's different severity levels. Return of data, if you can't see down there. This is a big one that I always harp on. A lot of cloud contracts and hosting contracts, it's, sometimes it's written into the agreement or sometimes you've got to read between the lines. But they want to hold your data hostage. Their view is that if you don't pay your bills, I'm not giving you your data. You know, I'll keep your servers. I'll turn off your access. And my view, you know, representing you know, the customer of the service, I say, no way. Never. You can never keep my data hostage because we may have a little payment dispute over $5,000 and you're going to try to put me out of business over that $5,000. Now, you can sue me. Go ahead and sue me for the $5,000. I'll even give you attorney's fees, whatever you want. But you can never hold my data hostage to try to put me out of business and gain leverage. Yeah, you had a question? What about when you terminate service and you know they've been doing something for you and they have all that data 10 million times an iron mountain? Yep. They can't take that away. <laughs> it's not gonna go yep. I, a lot of providers, they, they will say point blank, yeah, we don't want to give you your data because we want you to pay your bill. That's, that's their leverage. Yeah, we actually add two clauses to this list, and one is uh, data ownership, or ownership of data or services. And that includes you know, the right to return data on termination and all yep. that stuff. But uh, some cloud services will actually consider the data you give them their data. Yep. Uh, the other thing is the cost of remediation. Who bears the cost of remediation? That's usually a big point of contention for our contracts. Yep. So that's, that's something you need to do up front with um, the risk assessment. So you need to have what what you're going to actually do for loss of governance um, within within the contract. You know, if, if, if it, how how is the data going to be returned? How is it going to be destroyed? You need to have the whole data life cycle built into um, the upfront risk assessment. Yep. I mean, a lot of the uh, uh, cloud providers will say you should have a backup of your data. Don't rely just on us. And then also, it's the money issue. They're, they're quite honest. They say, yeah, we want the leverage to make you pay. And the contract can say, well, we own the data, and a provider will be like, fine, you still own it. We're still not giving it to you. you know, but you still own it. I actually have put into contracts plain English that says, even if we breach the contract, you will give us our data. You know, I mean, from a, as a customer's point of view, if it's critical data, I just can't see any reason to ever hold that data hostage. Because it would be saying to the provider, well, if you, know, if you don't meet five nines, then I can burn down your data center. You know, it's going to teach you a lesson. I just don't think it's right. Um, the lawyer term, the most important term, down at the bottom, limitation of liability. We got all of these security obligations, audits, breach, uptime, support. We're going to do all these great things. If we fail, what's your remedy? And your remedy may be, we'll give you back your fees for one month. We'll give you a little service credit. That's the catch to a lot of this. And I've seen a lot of cloud providers that say, you know what? I'm going to give you the most gorgeous security commitment you've ever seen in your life. But I am not changing my limitation of liability. So if I breach my security obligation, you get one month's fees as credit, which is not much of a remedy. So you want to work with those hand in hand. Um, not to embarrass Microsoft, but let's embarrass Microsoft. Uh, they had a breach in their cloud computing service. I was actually negotiating a contract for their BPOS service when this came out and uh, sent it to the team. I said, see, this is why I'm harping on this stuff. You can have breaches. Uh, so they had a breach in their BPOS service, which they are very aggressively trying to sell to uh, corporate customers. So if you're negotiating a contract with them, you can point to this URL and say, you know, this is why I'm concerned. And social media, I'm not going to go there. That's a whole different uh, subject. It is a big, big topic, uh, <coughs> huge security risk um, for every organization because of what people do online. But that can be a, another talk another time. All right? Yeah, that's, that's terrific, Gary. Thank you very much. All right. Um, and I'm happy to answer any, you know, more questions if, uh, if there are more questions. <laughs>